it's a game about acceptance and I really like that and I think it's telling that a lot of people with mental health issues have responded really positively to the game and we get a lot of emails and um, letters from those people saying that it's helped them through a really difficult time and for me that's because it's about the struggle of being human that it's hard and that we love and that we grieve and we lose but we come through it and those things are what makes us human that it's transformative and that the pain is part of life and that's a really beautiful message and I think that's what you do so well Dan that's what you write about you write about what it is to be human so Dan you wrote it <laughs> um, without wanting to cop out one of the things about writing it that I really wanted to do was to make something that people could take and could own and it would be their take on it and that their interpretation of it mattered in a way that mine didn't my job was to give them the architecture to interpret in their way so I think that is a cop out <laughs> I do I think as I a think writer you always have yeah I think it's redemptive but I don't think the redemption is as cut and dried as it's all okay at the end. It's not okay at the end. But there is, there is a release, there's an escape, that bad times will happen, but they will end. And they won't always end positively, but they will end. And that's the, I think, the redemption of it, of saying that you... you this too never shall easy. pass. This too shall pass, Which my mum yeah. always says, you know, and I think that's probably the motto of the Chinese room, yeah, actually, absolutely. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't think it's as... as kind of openly positive as say Rapture had a much more strongly positive end I don't think Esther had I think it's much greyer than that um, but I think fundamentally it's about coming to terms So, Dear Esther is the first walking simulator. How yeah. do you feel about walking simulator? Uh, you know what, I was... I think I, I took offence to it when it first became a thing. But, uh, you know, I think it actually... I don't mind it so much now. I think the fact that we have kind of taken ownership over it, like, our that genre has been kind of... Uh, made our own by not just our game but like a bunch of different games have kind of embraced it um, I don't know what do you guys think well, I'm still really confused about the need to categorise in games probably more than any other creative industry and I think it shows that games have a long way to come in terms of how we describe an experience so I do agree with Rob that it's really positive that we reclaimed Walking Simulator but I still find it reductive possibly as a term what about you Dan I think for me it's it's people want to know what they're what they're buying and what they're getting into and I think it's so people understand what a walking simulator is now in a way that if it was like first person adventure or slow moving not very interactive story driven games they're all sort of really very fluffy but I think if you buy a game and someone says it's a walking simulator now you, you've got a pretty idea what you're getting you know there's Gone Home, Firewatch, Stanley Parable there's so many other really good titles that kind of fall within that group of games out there now that it does have an identity and I think that's the really good thing about it I mean when Esther came out there was literally nothing we had no idea how we described it or no, what we, we called it we actually struggled with that quite a lot when it yeah came and sort of ended up being sort of like a ghost story because it felt like it was the closest thing we could get but it feels like now you can make a game like this and you can say it's a walking simulator and people will know what it is straight away yeah I think I think that's the nice thing is, is there's a whole group of games out there now that, that quite comfortably put themselves into that category and so it's, it's like if we were to come out before and just said it's a walking simulator. People would have been like, "Well, that sounds terribly boring. That doesn't. <laughs> why the hell would I play that?" But now people kind of are a Seek little bit. them out. Yeah, now people are kind of familiar with what that means. Uh, the people that are there who actually seek this sort of stuff out, and it's kind of really cool. I mean, me myself, I would actually do that, use that as a term to search. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a very simplified term for what our game is. Uh, and there's obviously a lot more to it than walking. Um, but I think when you look at other genres, they're also kind of very simplified. You know, 
first person shooter role playing game uh, it's you know it uh, to me it doesn't seem as bad as any of those other things The last level ended up being quite a lot bigger than the, the original mod. And it's also the one where actually the, the movement around it is in a way the most artificial. There's the big zigzagging cliff path that basically it's like a series of straight lines from point to point. There isn't a lot of movement. And one of the things that was really difficult to do with that was to not make it feel too much like a corridor and to give it that sort of sense of space and that you were actually exploring somewhere quite natural. Um, I think, Rob, there was stuff which you put in there, like little new beat moments, like the ruins at the edge of the, the cliff, yeah. that just helped the player feel like they were on a journey rather than being pushed through a pipe. Yeah, there was, it was kind of just giving the player the reward for, for continuing on, and it, it, you know, kind of still giving them some aspect of exploration, the things to discover. Um, I mean, the journey in this one is, is mostly uh, vertical. Um, but in the mod, there wasn't a lot to see or do. So I, I just tried like layering in some very subtle things, things that didn't necessarily add huge arcs to the story, but just kind of added little little uh, questions more than anything else. Um, like I added the dock there with mm -hmm. uh, at the end. There was this, yeah, there's, there's lots of little bits and pieces that have kind of been layered in. To, to really uh, just make it a lot more of an interesting place despite the size. There's a bit of an illusion of simplicity with uh, games like Dear Esther that people kind of assume because there's not a lot of mechanics and there's not much going on in that sense that they're easy to make. And I think actually it's kind of the opposite in a way that because they're so simple, everything is exposed and everything has to be exceptionally good for it to work because you are you're carrying a player's experience on a, on a fairly sparse, minimal kind of framework and that really means that every aspect of it has to be produced at a really high quality and has to be done with a lot of passion and a lot of thought. There's nowhere to hide in a game like Esther um, and that's something which I think carries through to the best games of this type, you can see with all of them, is a real commitment to kind of depth and a really intelligent way of approaching design and a real kind of trust in the player and a real assumption that players are smart, imaginative people who want experiences. There's no, it's not a game that it's easy to just knock off or to do with any kind of lazy attitude. You have to be really, really passionate and care a great deal and put an awful lot of thought into it if it's going to work. One of the things that I think was added uh, more frequently in the in the the final version of Dear Esther was the inclusion of a number of ghosts in the game. Um, these are not like ghosts that you'd see in a normal horror game. They're just very uh, loose uh, silhouettes that you will see around the islands, usually like quite off a distance off or just kind of somewhere that you'd barely see it out the corner of your eye. I think this is a good example of, of where it's kind of really in your face um, and these are kind of just something that we put in to kind of uh, not just bring some uh, unreal elements to the island but something supernatural as well, something that's kind of 
beyond uh, this world, something kind of unsettling. Um, and yeah, we've, you know, a lot of effort's been put in to make these things very subtle. I don't, didn't really want them to be like, I didn't want it to be a ghost story, uh, so to speak, but I just kind of wanted to bring some of this supernatural element into the game and, and this area is is probably one of the most prominent because you can see it just before you you go down into the the gully here um, and I think it's 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 really uh, one of my favorite scenes just because of it being so spooky so so unreal and so uh, uh, interesting The Overlook, the point about this to me is that it's probably the, the voiceover in the game that kind of sums up the whole story and the experience. It's almost like a, a recap of everything that's gone before, before you start the final climb. And you know it's the before you're going to start the final climb and before the game's kind of uh, builds to a climax. But you can also see the whole level, and it's like the idea that you are standing, looking down on your own journey, a bit like... seeing your body but being having an out of body experience at the moment of death and it was really designed to try and get that feeling as the player that you stop and you take stock of everything and there's a bit of a sense of there's no going back you take a breath and now it finishes and I really wanted to kind of achieve that sort of sense and I, I think we did I think it really came together here that you've got that sense of going right now this ends and now I move forwards to it So here it, it kind of, uh, the environment becomes a little bit more surreal again. Uh, we kind of play with the colours a little bit, bring up the saturation, it's kind of a little bit of a return to some of the more cave-like aesthetics in terms of colours color, and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's kind of there to kind of signpost a, uh, a another significant moment in the game or something that's leading up to the significant moment. It goes back to this kind of idea of having these uh, emotional signposts in the visuals of the game um, without it being overly obvious. And, and some of that uh, emotional stuff comes through just through the colors of the environment. And, and the more saturated they are, the more kind of surreal things become. Uh, so this is kind of like a turning point in the game. It's kind of like the, the final notice of you reaching the end. The music that's playing here is uh, a repeat of another cue and originally we hear it played on the piano and the string quartet take on the piece here. And it's one of those really nice instances where we were in the studio and I had this idea of how it was going to sound and I thought it was going to be quite full and rich and, yeah, full-bodied. And then one of the string players said to me, this is wrong, actually, for what we're playing. And they said, let's take, strip out all the vibrato, let's play it in a really Scottish, plain style. And it absolutely transformed that piece, and it's one of the really special things about being a composer, is that you get to collaborate with people who come fresh to it so you have this preconceived idea of how it should be and they know to turn it around and think about it like this and it absolutely fits and works for that scene because what we're getting at this point is a sense of fragility of an ending and it's almost reminiscent of a funeral procession it's slow and it's dirge like but yeah it was just a lovely moment where they gave something of themselves and that's what's amazing about working with live instrumentalists you're never going to get that from a sample it was possible that this last section of the game could have felt quite laborious and forced because it's two long zigzagging paths that just go up and there was a real importance to getting it right and quite a lot of work went into it i think at this point for me you probably as a player understand that the narrator is going to die at the end and that this is it and that unlike where the rest of the island there's this sense of this could just keep and keep going on forever and ever and ever and you're going to keep the, the thing the motif of come back come back but i think